after hours of research, days of typing, and weeks of editing, the FIFA World Cup Iceberg Part 2. I know I changed the name. Looking back, the International Football Tournament Iceberg was a pretty long and shit title. Is finally out, and it's 40 minutes long. So what the f- So after a long wait, part two is finally out. And at least it's before the uh, 22 World Cup, eh? Or well, at least when I'm writing the script it is. Um, and of course now when I'm speaking right now, the World Cup hasn't happened yet either. Me in the future editing this, can we have a quick update? Yep, it's still not the World Cup yet. If you guys haven't seen part one, I highly recommend you do so first. Just bear in mind, part one was made nearly a year ago now and I only scratched the surface of the iceberg. And today we're going to go more in depth into the forgotten events, mysterious happenings, scandals and conspiracies surrounding the World Cup. You can click the card in the top right hand corner or there will be a link in the description to the first part if you haven't seen it yet. But anyways, I'll stop waffling and let's get straight into the iceberg. Alright, I was lying. I just need to shoot some plugs quickly and then we can get straight back to the video. <gasps> So I've got a second channel now too. No, it's too oh. Well, no, shorter, less edited, but more frequent videos. Oh, fuck me! I say more frequent. I'm very inconsistent anyway. I can hardly uh, manage one channel, let alone two. <laughs> also, I'm going to be uploading stream highlights there, which means I am streaming. Ooh, ooh. Uh, check me out on Twitch at Suknos if you want to see some scuff streams. <laughs> and finally, just, just subscribe. Subscribe right now. Oh, yeah. Cameroon Jersey 2002. So it's the 2002 African Cup of Nations. Cameroon boasting the likes of Samuel Eto'o in the ranks look like favourites to win. And they did, but that's not what we're looking at today. Uh, we're interested in what they were wearing. Their kit, as you can see, had no sleeves and looked more like a baseball jersey. Uh, FIFA came out and said that their kit was illegal and they had to change it before they competed in the World Cup the following year. They did so by wearing black sleeves under the vest to make FIFA happy. But that isn't the end of the story. The Chads, Puma and Cameroon clearly had bigger balls than FIFA thought. And for the next African Cup of Nations, two years after the World Cup, they decided to outdo their original kit. But how? How would you outdo a sleeveless kit? Well, by wearing a onesie, obviously. Why can I just imagine Samuel Eto'o smashing in a 30-odd screamer wearing a bunny onesie? Shit! So back to the Cameroon kit. <laughs> the shirt and shorts were joined together and FIFA were not happy about this. Uh, but Cameroon didn't care, they wore the kit the whole tournament anyway. Uh, they were handed a $154,000 fine and docked 6 points for the next World Cup qualifying group stage. The Holy Water Scandal. This is the first knockout round of the 1990 World Cup. Argentina play rivals Brazil. Previous to this match, Brazil has breezed through the group stages, finishing first while Argentina struggled, just sneaking through as one of the best third place sides. During the first half of the game, Brazil were dominant and Maradona was kept from having any impact on the game by the defender named Branco. During a pause in play, Branco drank a bottle of water handed to him by an Argentinian member of staff. I think you might know where this is going. He later said he felt drowsy and disoriented after drinking that aforementioned bottle of water. During most of the second half, Maradona had much more time on the ball and was not being pressured at all by the dazed Branco and assisted the only goal of the match in the 81st minute to make Argentina win 1-0. So the question is, what happened to Branco? Well, Maradona, not being the cleverest people, uh, confessed that he spiked the drink with tranquilizer during an Argentinian TV show. Somehow, <laughs> nobody was charged. I have, <laughs> I have no fucking idea. Brazil's white jersey. So when you think of Brazil's football kit, you think of a yellow top with a green accent. Uh, but they don't always have this as their home kit. Before 1950, they wore quite a quite a sexy white jersey. But why do they not have this as their home jersey today? Uh, for that, you need to go back to 1950. And it was the final of the World Cup. Brazil, the hosts at the time, were playing Uruguay. The game had the largest recorded attendance ever at a football match at just under 200,000 people. The press and the public were so confident Brazil were gonna win that there were reports that people were celebrating days before the match even happened, but their cockiness got the better of them and they lost 2-1 to Uruguay. After the match, Brazilians couldn't believe they actually lost the match and many newspapers and fans denied it. For some reason, they blamed losing the match on the jersey being white and blue. Of course, the colors, of the Uruguayan flag. So the Brazilian FA decided to change their jersey to the colours yellow and green to represent their flag. And they've kept, of course, that kit to this day. The 1934 World Cup 
fixed. The 1934 World Cup was the second World Cup ever, and it was hosted in Italy. Mussolini at the time, as you might well know, um, was a president and self-proclaimed dictator of Italy and wanted to spread his political ideologies of fascism all over the world uh, and show that Italy aren't a force to be messed with. That's why reports say Italy have fixed the World Cup. However, Italy still claim to this day that they deserve champions and still hold the 1934 World Cup. To this day! To this day! France versus Ireland World Cup qualifier 2009. Any Irish people that are watching right now? Yeah, <laughs> you, you know what's going to happen. It's the second leg of the final round of qualifying for the 2010 World Cup. Both France and Ireland finished second in their qualifying group stages, which meant they have to go through a knockout two-legged match to see who would qualify. The first leg ended 1-0 to France. The second leg, after 90 minutes, was 1-0 to Ireland, meaning they will draw in aggregate and the match will go into extra time. With 13 minutes on the clock, the ball is lumped into the Ireland penalty area. The ball came to Thierry Henry, uh, who kept the ball on the pitch by using his hand twice and then passing across for a little sweaty goal to his teammate to score. If you don't know, you can't actually do that. France held on to the lead and qualified for the World Cup, knocking out Ireland. The incident was labelled Le Hand of Frog. I think that might be a bit racist. <laughs> Cheating their way to the World Cup clearly didn't help though because France finished bottom of their group with an embarrassing one point from three games. Now I need to search up how this guy says his name. <laughs> right, got it. Mario Zagallo. I uh, hopefully, I don't think I butchered that, but there's definitely going to be names late in the iceberg. I will butcher. I will butcher. I'm looking at. I'm looking at that one down there. Yeah, I will, I'm gonna butcher him. This guy Zagallo. He's he's a fucking baller. He's a Brazilian legend who not only won two World Cups as a player in 1958 and 1962, but also won it as a manager of Brazil in 1970 and an assistant manager in 1994. So altogether, he holds a record winning four World Cups. He also joined the greats of Germany's Franz Beckenbauer and France's Didier Deschamps to have won the World Cup as a player and a manager. Uruguay four stars. So if you didn't know, the stars above a nation's badge indicates how many World Cups they have won. Brazil, as you can see, having five and England having one. So why do Uruguay have four when they've only won two World Cups? They do glitch. Uh, no. So apparently, football played at the 1924 and 1928 Olympics are the only two competitions outside the World Cup that are recognised by FIFA. And guess who won both of them? Yep, Uruguay. So because they're recognised by FIFA, they're allowed to have the two stars from before. Add that to them having the 1930 World Cup and the 1950 World Cup. And they've got four stars. Paul the Octopus. Now, Paul was a common octopus who predicted some of the 2008 Euros and 2010 World Cup matches. Basically, there would be two identical boxes, both with food in, and the box represented two teams that would play against each other. Whichever box Paul went to first would be classed as his prediction to win the game. Out of the 14 matches he predicted, he somehow got 12 right. With every match in the 2010 World Cup, he predicted he got right. There's got to be some black magic going on there. In this weird change of events, this started a mini trend of animals predicting football matches as crazy as that fucking sounds with leon the porcupine in australia petty the hippopotamus in serbia and manny the parrot in singapore also on a, another side tangent there was a thriller made in china in 2010 called kill octopus paul <laughs> i'm not making this shit up which depicts paul's predictions as being part of an international match fixing scheme i don't know about you but i actually kind of want to watch this film Certified side nigga secret. <laughs> I need to think. Not better. <laughs> Sensational. <laughs> Yeah.
Lucien Laurent. So basically, he's a French footballer who scored the first World Cup goal ever in 1930. Apart from that, from what I can see, he's done jack shit. The Battle of Santiago and Ken Aston. It's a 1962 World Cup and host Chile are about to play Italy in one of the most violent games in all of football. Good evening. The game you're about to see is the most stupid, appalling, <laughs> There was lots of shit talking from the press before the match between the two countries, but in general, Italy called Chile poor and Chile called Italy fascists and Nazis. So as you can see, there was lots of tension before the match. And in the first 12 seconds, there was already the first foul. Oh, and did I mention there wasn't actually at this time no yellow or red cards implemented into matches in football. The only way to send players off was by ejecting them off the field and if they didn't comply, getting police to literally drag them off. This was implemented in the eighth minute of the game. <laughs> uh, the police intervened in the game another three times while players either kicked each other in the head or sending dodgy hooks out like it's a YouTuber boxing match. Somehow the match wasn't abandoned. The game finished 2-0 to Chile. The referee of the match, Ken Aston, later implemented the idea of yellow and red cards in the later 1970 World Cup. Sweden 1994. So we've got another underdog story, boys. Sweden was in the group stages of the 1994 World Cup, finishing second and going unbeaten, winning against Russia and drawing against Cameroon and Brazil in the round of 16. Sweden played against Saudi Arabia in Dallas, where the game was extremely hot, reaching temperatures of 14 degrees Celsius or wherever the fuck that is in Fahrenheit. They beat them 3-1 and then beat Romania on pens in the next round. However, in the semi-final, they lost to Brazil. <laughs> Their story didn't finish there because they got a bronze medal by beating Bulgaria 4-0 in the third place playoff. Turkey 2002. Alright, this is the last underdog story for a while. They finished second in a group just behind Brazil. In the round of 16, they faced one of the hosts, Japan, and beat them 1-0. Then they beat Senegal 1-0 in Golden Goal. But yet again, Brazil has come back and beat the underdogs to force them to a third place playoffs. <laughs> Anyway, they beat the other host, South Korea, in that third place playoff and finished third. Serbia and Montenegro, 2006. So I've already talked about Yugoslavia in the first part. Their country disbanded in 2003, but for some political reason, I don't really want to research it, I don't really give a shit. Serbia and Montenegro wanted to stay together. So the country was called... Serbia and Montenegro. That was that was one one country was called Serbia and Montenegro. They qualified for the 2006 World Cup, but finished bottom of their group with zero points. A week after their <coughs> a week after their final match against the Ivory Coast, the nation disbanded, and it was just Serbia and Montenegro, not Serbia and Montenegro. Do you understand? They were one country, but now they're. Two. The country only lasted for like three years. Bogota's bracelet. So the defending champions at the time, England, went to South America for some friendlies to prepare themselves for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. However, just before the World Cup starts, Captain Bobby Moore was detained in Colombia and accused of stealing a bracelet from a jewellery store. Though he was released a couple days later after there wasn't any sufficient evidence, and Bobby Moore just went to the World Cup anyways and played for England. 1966 World Cup fixed. So anyone can come up with conspiracy theories. I can say that I could just say the Earth's flat and nobody would believe me, right? This can't be real. This can't be fucking real. Nobody's going to believe a conspiracy theory unless you have evidence or in a place of power. Luckily for Zhao Havelange, 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 Whoever, Zhao, Zhao, who was a former FIFA president, so people actually listened. Well, sort of. He said that the 1966 World Cup, won by England, and the 1974 World Cup, won by Germany, was rigged to let the host countries win. His proof? Well, he said Brazil should have easily won. Okay, Zhao, time to take off your tin foil hat. Mussolini threats. It's a 1938 World Cup, and for the Italians, it would be their second final win in a row, winning 4-2 against Hungary. At the end of the game, Hungarian goalkeeper... Fuck off, fuck off. <laughs> Hungarian keeper, Antal Sabor, said, I may have let in four goals, but at least I saved their lives. Wait, what the fuck is he talking about? Uh, to find out, we have to go before the match even started. Mussolini, the dictator, of course, is Italy at the time, like I mentioned, supposedly sent a telegram to the Italian players, which translated in English meant win or die. I mean, that's one way to motivate your players. You've got to fucking die to get three points. We're here in Mythbusters. We find fact from myth. I've never watched a single second of Mythbusters in my life. Well, here's, here's some actual 
hard-hitting facts. First off, he would be a little bit harsh since they did literally win the last World Cup. Though, as mentioned earlier, that could have been fixed. But they still, still the point stands, they literally did just win the last World Cup. Secondly, all the players were loyal supporters of Mussolini and his ideologies. The idea that he would kill off potential role models in his eyes for the public would be pretty stupid. I'm guessing he's not the smartest guy anyway though. Finally, the term directly translated to English means win or die, but we all know Google Translate is a bit shit. It was actually a common phrase back in the day that meant victory or bust. Basically meaning it's now or never. So that is myth busted. 2010 North Korean fans. I'm doing the quotation marks like with my fingers if you could see me right now. Uh, so North Korea in the first place being at a World Cup is pretty weird due to how their countries run and the only time before qualifying for a 2010 World Cup was 1966. But the story about their fans is even weirder. Because nobody from North Korea is allowed to leave the country without permission from their dictator, a small portion of the fans were handpicked by the government, around 400 people. So that begs the question, there was more than 400 people at the World Cup supporting North Korea. So where did these fans come from? Well, the other 1,400 or so people were Chinese volunteers disguising themselves as North Korean fans. I mean, I could see Man City doing something like this for their home game soon. Just paying people money to pretend to be their fans. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this part of the script like quite a long time ago and I basically put here uh, well all I can really say is that if you type Gary Lineker into Google this is the first result and I was curious so I, I typed in Gary Lineker incident into Google <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this shit up. I'm just gonna show. I'm gonna show a bit of the clip now if I can. Hopefully, this video doesn't get taken down for literally somebody. Somebody shitted themselves on the pitch. <laughs> 1954 Germany doping. So West Germany beat Hungary 3-2 in the final of the 1954 World Cup after losing 8-3 to the same team in the group stage. So did Hungary have a bad day or was there something else going on? Well Germany claimed before the match they took vitamin C injections. But the thing is you can just get vitamin C by just eating an orange or some shit. It's a bit strange. Reports say that they could have taken performance enhancing drugs in particular speed. But like most allegations on this iceberg nothing has really come of it. Believe Bellini's trophy lift. Bellini was a defender and captain of the Brazil team. After their victory in the 1958 World Cup, he was credited with starting the tradition of lifting the trophy in the air after you've, of course, been crowned champions. Um, he initially did this so photographers could get a better view of the trophy and it's a gesture of course that is still tradition to this day. Colombia hosts in 1986. In 1974 Colombia won the bid to host the 1986 World Cup. At the time 16 teams competed in the competition. However this changed in 1982 just four years before Colombia was supposed to be hosting the World Cup where FIFA decided 24 teams would compete. With less than a four year warning by FIFA, Colombia pulled out hosting the World Cup due to not having the financial stability to accommodate an extra eight teams. 1983, only three years to work with, the host was changed to Mexico. Brazil versus Chile, World Cup qualifier, 1989. So it's Brazil versus Chile in the last match of qualifying for the 1990 World Cup. Before the match, they were level on points, with Brazil leading on goal difference. So Chile would need to win to qualify. The score was 1-0 to Brazil. In the 59th minute, when a flare was thrown onto the pitch, the Chilean keeper Roberto Rojo went down, presumably hit by it. Chilean players crowded around the officials while Rojo was being treated. While this was happening, Patricio de Yanez made a gesture to the Brazilian fans grabbing his nuts. They're his cojones, his cojones. <laughs> The Chilean team left the game in protest um, and the game was abandoned. <laughs> now the next day, pictures came back showing that the flare did not hit the Chilean keeper at all but landed almost a metre or so away. To add to this, there was no sign of gunpowder or, bur or burn marks on Rojo uh, to indicate that he got hit. The old injury was some sort of blade. Surely not. Rojo, after being questioned, convinced that he cut himself with a razor blade hidden in one of his gloves 
to fake an injury from the Brazilian fans. Him and some coaching staff hatched the plan so that the game would be nullified and played at Chile's ground or neutral ground. Ten days later, FIFA came out with the decision to give Brazil a 2-0 win via forfeit, Rojo to be banned for life from any FIFA competition, and Chile not to even compete in the qualifying at all for the 1994 World Cup. 1982 World Cup draw. So as previously mentioned, the 1982 World Cup in Spain was going to be the first World Cup to host 24 teams. And let's just say the draw was a complete fucking shambles. To sum it up, nobody really knew what they were doing, including FIFA officials it seemed. Teams were placed in the wrong groups and had to be redrawn. Balls broke when they were being spun. And at one point, even the cage spinning the balls broke. They finished the draw more than an hour later than planned. USA versus England, 1950. It's the group stage of the 1950 World Cup. England, favourites to win the whole tournament, played against the United States of America, who consisted of semi-professional players who all had second jobs. Walter Barr, a high school teacher, just we need to play in the World Cup. And many other players in the team were either postmen or dishwashers. One player, Ben McLaughlin, uh, had to withdraw from the World Cup because he couldn't get time off work. That's how much the Americans actually gave a shit about the World Cup. The team only trained once before the tournament. In everyone else's mind, USA were going to be absolutely walked over. But of course, in uh, England's old bottling fashion, that wasn't the case. USA went on to win the match 1-0. The result is still being held as one of the biggest upsets in World Cup history, where basically a Sunday league team beat the England squad. Bulgaria 1994. So it's 1994 group stages, Bulgaria, who apart from this tournament had only got to the round of 16 once, were placed in a group with Nigeria, Greece and Argentina. They would proceed to the knockout stages after beating an Argentina team without Maradona 2-0. They then went on to beat Mexico in the round of 16 on penalties and beat one of the favourites Germany in the quarterfinals after bringing the game to 2-1 after being 1-0 down. They went out in the semi-finals but recorded their highest finish ever being 4th place and star striker Stoichkov getting the golden boot with 6 goals. The 1930 World Cup. So in this iceberg there is loads of incidents and events surrounding the 1930 World Cup. The 1930 World Cup was, of course, the first World Cup to ever happen, and it it was quite it was quite bonkers. Lots of lots of shit happened. So I thought we should have a quick roundup of the 1930 World Cup qualification or lack of it. So the 1930 World Cup was the only World Cup to not feature any qualification. This is because there was only 16 nations that were associated with FIFA at the time. Due to the competition being hosted in Uruguay and the lack of aeroplane technology in the 1930s, European countries would have to make the long journey across the Atlantic Ocean by boat, of course. Add to the fact that the Great Depression was going on, meaning that most countries had uh, absolutely no money whatsoever. This meant by the time the deadline hit, only nine countries were entering in the World Cup and none of them were European. These countries were Uruguay, of course, Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru and the United States. In a large ditch effort to get some European diversity, the Uruguayan FA made a trip to Europe to try and convince European countries to enter. In the end, four European teams were added, that was Belgium, France, Romania and Yugoslavia, taking the total teams to the tournament to 13. With a weird amount of teams, the format was a bit different to other World Cups. Group 1 contained four teams, while the other three groups contained three teams, and only first place in their group would progress. This meant the group stages there was only a semi-final and a final. The group stages. Group 1 consisted of Argentina, Chile, France and Mexico. France played their first two matches within three days of each other. By their second game against Argentina, their goalkeeper Alex Thapot had to leave the field after 20 minutes due to the injury and Laurent, the guy we spoke about earlier, scored the first ever goal for the World Cup, hobbled about the whole game injured. And because back in their time, there was no subs at all. They only had the strict 11 players. They couldn't really do anything. So they basically played the game with nine men. Argentina was winning 1-0, but France was through on goal when the referee blew his whistle six minutes early. The game continued later, but the French protested uh, with the ref, but nothing really happened. Another notable match in this group was Argentina beating Mexico 6-3 with Guillermo Stabil scoring a hat-trick in his international debut. It was all despite Argentina's talisman, Manuel Ferrari, who returned back to his home country to take a law exam. Argentina finished top of the group. Group 2 contained Brazil, Bolivia and Yugoslavia. Brazil were clear favourites, 
but they were stunned when in their opening game they lost against Yugoslavia 2-1. Yugoslavia would also go on to beat Bolivia 4-0 and of course top the group. In their final match where neither Brazil or Bolivia could qualify, Brazil won 4-0. Two goals being scored by Preguinho, Pe Preguinho, I'm going to go with that, who as well as being a footballer, played volleyball, basketball, water polo, swimming, hockey and track and field all competitively. This guy's an absolute machine. Group 3 contained host Uruguay as well as Romania and Peru. The opening match, Peru vs Romania, had Placio Galindo of Peru, I'm butchering so many names here, removed from the tournament for reasons still unknown. That's because the official attendance of the match was around 2,500, but reports say that it was more like 300 people, easily the smallest attendance at any World Cup game because nobody gave a shit. Oh, fuck. Talking about the Uruguayan team, they had a vigorous four weeks training before the World Cup, which included keeper Andres Mazzali dropped from the squad after trying to visit his wife after curfew. They went on to beat Peru 1-0 and Romania 3-0 to top the group. The final group contained Belgium, Paraguay and the USA. There was nothing mental that really happened in the group, except from the group favourites Belgium missing out on the top spot after the USA beat the Philippic side 3-0. The semi-final. The first semi-final was the USA versus Argentina. America lost midfielder Rafael Tracy after only 10 minutes to a broken leg. Argentina scored their first goal from the halfway line from this guy called Monty. The match ended 6-1 to Argentina after Americans couldn't keep up with the pace of the Argentinian attack. The other semi-final was Uruguay versus Yugoslavia, which mirrored the same scoreline uh, with Uruguay winning 6-1. Now, officially, third place playoff was introduced in 1934, but apparently this was only because Yugoslavia at the time was so annoyed by the refereeing decisions I think they're just being salty. They literally lost 6-1. But anyway, they got the first ship back home and wasn't even in the country when the third place playoff was supposed to be played. But in the end, both USA and Yugoslavia got a bronze medal. On to the final now. Uruguay versus Argentina. This was a replay of the 1928 Summer Olympic final. The gates were open six hours before the match at 8am so supporters could be searched for weapons. By the time the match started at noon, the ground was full with the official attendance being 93,000. In every match, in the 1930 World Cup, a team would bring their own unique ball because there wasn't an entire separate ball for the whole competition. This wasn't an issue until both teams decided that they would bring a ball for the final. FIFA intervened and said Argentina should provide the ball for the first half and Yugoslavia should provide the ball for the second half. The Belgian referee, Jean Le Guin's, was chosen only a few hours before the match because all the officials were fearing for their life to be honest if they made an incorrect decision. John thought he should make a make a plan for a quick escape if he needed to. So what he did, he requested a boat, uh, which would be the nearest harbour for him. So when the game ends, he can basically just run like a motherfucker to the boat and hope that nobody basically kills him on the way. Uh, the game ended 4-2 to Uruguay and they would become champions of the first World Cup. Fuck off. Sheikh Fahad al Hamad al Sabah. Try fitting that on the back of a shirt. <laughs> so Fahad was a prince for the royal family in Kuwait and was watching his team get absolutely smashed by France. Kuwait conceded their fourth goal of the match when defenders started protesting the goal because they heard a whistle somewhere and thought it was the ref. Uh, so they stopped playing. <laughs> what a shit excuse. More protests happened and soon the entire squad and staff were arguing with the ref. That's when Fahad came down to the pitch from the stands to have a talk with the ref. Right, I'll tell you what. And he somehow got his way and the goal was chalked off. I guess arguing with the ref really does get you somewhere. Or not, because French scored again and the match finished 4-1 anyway. Jules Rimmett speech 1950. So as mentioned, all the way back in layer 4 at the start of the video, before the 1950 final, everyone expected Brazil to beat Uruguay. So much that Jules Rimmett, the FIFA president at the time, prepared a whole speech in Portuguese to congratulate the winning of the World Cup. Instead, when Uruguay won it, he just silently handed them the trophy. That is Storm's collision. It's a semi-final of the 1982 World Cup. France versus West Germany. Patrick Battiston was subbed on for France in the second half. Only 10 minutes later, he would end up on the end of a through ball and he would be a one on one. Battiston took the shot, which missed, but not before the German keeper, Harold Schumacher, jumped in the air, twisted his body, absolutely fucking battered Battiston in the head, which knocked him unconscious with also suffering damaged vertebrae and teeth knocked out. In the end, Battiston made a complete full recovery, but what do you think was given to Schumacher? 
the one who committed the fucking mental challenge. A yellow card? A red card? Motor game suspension? No. A fucking goal kick. The <laughs> FSML didn't even think it was a foul. Mental. Mental. Fucking mental. Disgrace of Dijon. We go back yet again to the West Germany 1982 World Cup. This time early in the competition, in the last group stage match. This group consisted of Germany, Austria, Algeria and Chile. The last two, Algeria and Chile, already played their game a day before the match. This left the group looking like this. If West Germany won by one or two goals, both them and Austria would go through. If they won by more than that, then Algeria would go through. If West Germany drew or lost, both Algeria and Austria would go through. So the game started, and for the first 10 minutes, Germany were fully on top, scoring in the 10th minute. And then the game would go stale, to the point where both teams didn't look like they wanted to actually be there. Passing around the back and hardly even attacking. This is because if the score stayed how it is, both teams would go up. Fans were booing at Exton Stadium. The match finished with no more goals and both teams progressed to the knockout stages. Both teams were accused of match fixing, but nobody was charged. From that point on, both group stage third matches would be played at the same time to avoid this. India 1950 before 1950, India never even got close to being in a World Cup, though at that time, Burma, Indonesia and the Philippines all withdrew from Asian qualifying, leaving the only other team competing from Asia left and therefore would automatically qualify for the World Cup would be India. But after being told the news, they withdrew from the competition. Now reports say there were a few reasons why. First of all, the Indian Football Federation thought that the Olympics were a bigger competition and would focus on the 1952 Summer Olympics. How'd that turn out for you? Other reasons was that it would cost too much to travel to Brazil to compete. Finally, one of the most mental reasons is that FIFA was not allowing players to play in the tournament barefoot. Now, you would think that's quite reasonable, but it was very normal for Indian footballers at the time to not wear football boots at all, or any boots, just playing absolutely barefoot. And they were even allowed prior to the 1948 Olympics. Luis Monti. We already talked about Luis Monti and his antics in the 1930 World Cup with Argentina. But what if I told you he would reach another the final. In fact, he would win the next World Cup, the 1934 World Cup. Now, some of you that are following along might say, well, Argentina didn't win the 1934 World Cup. And they didn't, but Monti's Italian citizenship, and he was playing for Juventus at the time, meant that he could just play for the Italian team and therefore win another World Cup. He is the only player ever to play in two World Cup finals with two different countries. And it very much stayed that way because since 2004, you can only play for one country in a match that isn't a friendly or under 23s. Basically, any World Cup, Euros, Copa America, etc., match before the age of 21 you cannot play for another nation so theoretically if you wanted to match Monty's record you have to win a world cup before the age of 21 then switch nations to somebody that you have citizenship with and then win another final i just kind of don't see that happening anytime soon <laughs> north korea champions hoax so we're back again with north korea being North Korea. This time we're talking about the multiple alleged times the North Korean government have told the people that live there that they have won the World Cup and probably other things. I'm assuming this would get used as propaganda saying that they are the best nation and that Ronaldo could easily get spun by Kim Jong-un any day of the week. The Curse of Tilkara. Ooh, scary. Well, no because it really isn't true anymore. <laughs> anyway, Argentina went to the town of Tilcara to get used to the high altitudes they would face in the 1986 World Cup in Mexico. They promised the town's virgin, all right, this is getting a bit weird, <laughs> that they would bring back the trophy to the town if they won. They did win, but broke the promise because they didn't come back. For the next 35 years, they would not win a single trophy because of the curse. Ooh. Well, until last year when they won the Copa America. So I guess the curse was kind of bullshit. Conspiration 58. So this was a Swedish mockumentary that claimed the 1958 World Cup didn't actually exist. So basically the premise of this film was that this specific World Cup couldn't have taken place due to the whole Sweden not having the economical or technical resources to present such a large event. In the plot of the film, spoilers if you want to watch this random piece of media from 2002 in Swedish, the CIA was uh, testing how effective it was to use televised propaganda. I said at the start that it was a mockumentary, meaning that they're mocking a actual proper documentary like they are mocking a documentary format however audiences were not told this until 
after the show was aired. So upon the airing of the show, people thought that it was real until, of course, at the end when they revealed that it was a mockumentary. The next few of these cover distressing topics that viewers may find disturbing. Trigger warnings for death, kidnapping and terrorism. And sorry, there's not going to be much of the uh, low ha-ha funny moments anymore from this point on. Joe Geekjans. So the 1950 World Cup has a lot of weird things that were going on and this is another one. Joe was a Haiti born striker who played for the US in the World Cup after impressing in the ASL, basically the old MLS. He scored the only goal in the shock victory against England but he wasn't interested in getting a US citizenship. So after he left the ACL, he headed back to Haiti. He retired in 1957, but that isn't what we're interested in. So Joe was not interested in politics in the slightest, but his family was. He was related to Louis Dijon, who lost the 1957 presidential election to Franz Duevla, and Joe's younger brother, Jean-Pierre and Fred, became associated with a group of exiles in the Dominican Republic he wanted to stage an overthrow of the Haiti government. The morning after Louis declared himself president for life, the whole of the Getjens family fled for fear that they would be associated with the exiled younger brothers, apart from Joe. He thought the president would not be interested in him due to him being a sports figure and not interested in politics at all. That same morning, he was arrested and taken to a prison called Fort de Monge, notorious for his brutally inhumane practices where it's presumed he was killed. His body has never been found. The 1988 terrorist plot. Well, after some research, it looked like it's in 1998 because there wasn't a World Cup in 1988. So the attack was planned by Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda would attack England versus Tunisia players in the Marseille game, attack USA players in their hotels in Paris and fly a plane into a nuclear power plant to cause a nuclear meltdown. Luckily, this didn't happen. Multiple raids happened before the World Cup with more than 100 people being arrested in several different countries connected to the terrorist plot. Cruyff misses the 1978 World Cup. So Cruyff helped the Netherlands qualify for the 1978 World Cup, but retired from international football just before the tournament began. He would go on to play for another six years for his club. So why did he retire from international football? Well, this is how the story goes. In 2008, he was speaking to Radio Catalonia in Spain and was talking about, in 1977, him, his wife and his kids were tied up by home intruders and he had a rifle to his head. He didn't go over the whole ordeal, but he said that was the reason why he retired. He's quoted in saying, to play the World Cup, you have to be 200%. There are moments when there are other values in life. Matthias Sindelar. So Sindelar was an Austrian striker who played just before World War II. He was regarded as one of the best Austrian football players of all time. And some say might be one of the most underrated, but it's one moment that we want to talk about today. And it's his last and Austria's last match before merging with Germany in 1938. The Nazis who controlled Germany at the time demanded that the Austrian football team after this game would combine with the German team. Austria would play of course Germany in a friendly. In this game Austria would miss clear-cut chances almost on purpose probably to appease the Germans but in the last 20 minutes Sindelar would score and celebrate extravagantly in front of the senior Nazi officials. Also after this game Sindelar refused to play for Germany citing his age in being 35 at the time or an injury as an excuse. On the 23rd of January 1939, both Sindelar and his girlfriend were found dead in their apartment in Vienna. The official post-mortem concluded that they died of carbon monoxide poisoning, but there are many theories out there speculating from suicide to murder. The most common conspiracy is that the Gestapo, the secret police at the time, murdered them by a high-ranking Nazi officer. Alexandre Philippelin. Alexandre was a French midfielder who captained the French team in the 1930 World Cup and would play 20 25 matches for his nation before retiring internationally at the age of 24. Reporters say he'd done this because he wanted to focus on club football because, in quotes, that's where the money was. Basically, he would chase money all the time, always going to the club that would pay more, but greediness engulfed him. He fell out of love with football, not taking it up to training and matches, and would stop playing altogether in 1935 at the age of 30. In World War II, when Nazis invaded and took over France, Alexandre would become a collaborator with them doing their dirty work. One of the atrocious acts that he committed was on the 11th of June 1944, where he had 52 civilians executed, later arrested that year, and was sentenced to death after the atrocity he had committed with collaboration with the Nazis. Andres Escobar. Andres was a centre-back who played for Colombia, nicknamed the gentleman because he was known for his clean style of play and calmness on the pitch. In the 1994 World Cup group stage second match, Colombia would play the USA. Escobar, stretching to block a cross, accidentally deflected the ball into his own net, 
and would make the match 1-0. The match would finish 2-1 to the USA. This meant that Colombia could not qualify out of the group. Six days later, Escobar and his friends went out to a club in Colombia, where at approximately 3am he was murdered outside, shot six times by a member of a powerful Colombian cartel. The murder was widely believed to be a punishment for the own girl. Andres Escobar is still held in high regard by Colombian fans to this day. Wow. <sighs> can't believe I've actually finished this nearly one year after my last video. There were multiple times during planning, making, well I just thought this project was never going to be finished or completed, but with my resurgence of uh, enthusiasm in the past month, I was actually finally able to finish this. Now when the next video is coming out on this channel, I have no idea. <laughs> if you're not satisfied with that answer, tough shit. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I wanted to start making more content on this channel, I don't want to go on another year break. Well, hopefully I won't go on another year break. And I actually had lots of fun coming back to this project and making it. I don't know how much fun I'll have editing it though. Yeah, that, that might take a while. As I said at the beginning, I've got a second channel, which I'll be trying to upload some videos on there, some shorter videos of me just like dicking about really. If you're still here, um, to the two or three people that are still here, thank you so much. This was a real passion project for me, but I'm, I'm very happy I've got finally got this off of my chest. Hope you enjoyed this video, this long ass fucking video. Hope you have a great day and see you in the next one.